Archetypal Tarot Podcast explores universal human patterns, called archetypes, by investigating the major arcana of the ancient tarot. We recognize these archetypes because they are present in our own life stories, myths, and culture. Each card represents a stage of the journey for understanding the greater story of our lives. Welcome to the Archetypal Tarot Podcast. I'm Julianne Jabot, and with me is my co-conspirator, Sundara Quackenbush. Today, our subject is card number 15, the devil. And so we're going to discuss what this archetypal character might mean in, for the hero's journey, as well as how the archetypes of the addict and the provocateur play a role in this stage. So how you doing, Sundara? I'm doing pretty well. I'm, I'm excited about having the devil uh, join us today for yeah. this podcast. I think yeah. it's totally appropriate. We've got, uh, it's it's just after New Year's here, and I'm sure many people are uh, making resolutions, breaking resolutions, thinking about <laughs> um, good habits and maybe ones that aren't so good for him. So timing seems to be good. So let's, why don't we, as usual, take a look at, uh, take a look at our little devilish friend here as it's depicted in uh, the Marseille deck, as well as we're going to look at the Rider Waite, two pretty popular tarot decks. Yeah, so in the Marseille's deck, we've got we've got the devil standing right here in the center. Devil, it's the devil wearing yoga pants. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, seriously, if you look at this card, I'll put it on the show notes. I just took a look at this. I'm like, wow, those are nice yoga pants. With, well, a, with a package, too. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Fully displayed anatomy through the yoga pants, uh, which is very much like, I'm sure, you know, what people are trying to do as they get into yeah. it. They're like, I am going to sign up for a yoga class. Yoga classes are full right now. The gym's pretty crowded. Yeah. You know? little little belly here and uh, some, some man boobs. Uh, th there's an androgynous element to yeah. this devil yeah absolutely to this marseilles version uh he's got bat wings and uh and he appears to be left-handed right and and i think the most significant if you look at the at the marseilles card is there's a the the devil he she because it really does seem very androgynous is holding the sword by the blade <laughs> yeah yeah there's no handle to the sword that's yeah. really it's interesting. basically just a big sharp piece of steel so Whew, painful and uh and then below this devilish figure we have these two little impish looking characters uh that are tied by a rope that is attached to the base of uh looks like a vase of what the the devil is standing on and these little imps have their hands tied behind their back and they have these ropes that are fairly loose around the neck i yeah. must make that uh observation at this moment uh one imp even seems to be smiling as it's yeah, tied don't. up by the devil they the don't. other one looks not not quite as pleased and there are there in this in in both the Rider Waite and the Marseille in most of the depictions of the Devil card, these two imps or these two characters are pretty uh, clearly a masculine and feminine character. They're they are they do look like a man and a woman. I, and and just to talk a little bit about the Rider Waite, it's the Rider Waite card is in this uh, instance pretty similar. We have this sort of, it's more clear in the Rider Waite that we've got this pan type character. This. Um, a satyr who's half man, half um, animal, but it's scarier. It you, is you, scary. The, the card background is is darker. There's an upside down uh, pentagram, uh, which is often, uh, you know, recognized as a the symbol for the devil. And he's he's frowning. Whereas uh, in the Marseilles, you know, the, the, it's a smiling devil. You know, he's kind of crossing his eyes. On he's that crossing one, his eyes. You know, he he looks pretty. Uh, demeaning deceptive and so forth but but this guy's outright frowning in the rider weight deck uh an upside down torch uh that he's holding and uh and then those two more humanly looking imps this time around and they as i think the most important um part of these two characters that are chained up or tied up is that um and we'll talk about this a little later is that the, the chains or the ropes around their neck, they're not exactly tight. They're not wearing collars. They're they're loose enough that you you could take it you could take it off. 
And they don't look in either of the cars like they're struggling to get free. They're no. just hanging out there. It's it, To me, it's not a vision of hell, right? We see this devil character, but it's not necessarily that um, prototypical Christian view of hell where people are in... F- you know, forever in pain and in flames. This is, this to me really strikes me as something symbolic that we need to, we need to take a look at. It's not as blatant, I think. And I think this card's really fascinating. I mean, it's, it's huge. It's a really, they're big archetypes that I look forward to kind of unpacking a little bit here. Well, unpack we will do. So, but this is kind of weird that we reach these characters, right? So last card, we were at the Temperance. We had this very uh, beautiful, peaceful, angelic angel. Angel. Look, yeah, mm-hmm. we had the angel last time around. And then here we are. We have the fallen angel. Um, seems completely opposite. So what what sense can we make of this for the as a hero stage after the card of Temperance is, is the question we've got to figure out right now. True, and uh, to keep in mind that our next card is going to be the tower, so we have this angel, devil, tower. Wow. So there's a really interesting story, and before before we go too far into that, I wanted to point out what we were talking about earlier, Sandera, is we had the death card a couple cards ago, right? So there is this eagerness, I think, within all of us in terms of our lives when something dies or something goes away that we want to re- we got to be reborn. You know, we want to go from A to Z real quickly because it's going to be uncomfortable. And we're, you know, we're, rebirth isn't upon us yet. We are part, we are in this process. And if you look at these cards between death and judgment as being a part of this process. They are that mythological underworld and we're still in it. And so to put it in that context, we can see that, yeah, it kind of makes sense that, you know, the angel kind of pulls us out of this death period and we get a lot of um, information and lesson and guidance that we pick up from the angel. And then of course, we're going to have to come to the devil and meet what I would consider um, shadows. Yeah. That's right. And, and many people would prefer to skip this stage. But the te- what the beauty of the tarot is that it doesn't let us skip this stage. We've we've got to look at the shadowy aspects of ourselves. We have to look at uh, what is keeping us from reaching a, a pivotal point of, you know, I, 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 you know, I've studied you. I don't want to say throw the wholeness world around, but uh, I think this leads us into a good conversation about so if we, we want to mediate with the angel, mm-hmm. we, we might start to feel like we have to do, uh, we have to mediate, we have to be, start to take on the responsibility of that mediation. So we may begin to strive for perfection. Mm-hmm. Um, this is my rebirth period. I'm going to do it perfectly. I'm going to be fresh and new mm-hmm. and it's all going to be great. Well, the devil allows us to look a little deeper than that into what our human nature. And also, uh, given his bat wings and his half goat self, wearing yoga pants or not, <laughs> we have to look at our animal natures. That is that is what this is about. And I, I totally agree. I think it's so easy to think of the hero's journey as being a, a linear path. And I'll, I say this again, it's cyclical, right? And I, I think when we come upon the devil, because, you know, most of us have been around a few times. We've been around this circle any number of times. And we have we are always working with things that we crave and we desire, which is a lot to do with this card. And this sort of, we look at this as, another time that we're going to consciously really take a look at what what our relationship is to our body and our desires, emotional feelings, but this one is really focused on physical, physically manifested, real world, tangible stuff. What are we addicted to? What are, you know, in, in terms of how we make our choices, how does the devil, how does the addict archetype, how does the provocateur provoke us to maybe make choices that aren't the best for us? And how, how did that affect us in the past? 
So we're coming around like on a circle to say, oh, okay, now is a good time for me to really take a look at that. And, and it's New Year's too. So a right. lot of people are really, really looking at like, wow, where, where do I let myself down? Where do I break promises? But the, that superficial sort of, I'm not going to do A, B, and C in mm -hmm. this new year, it, they, they often don't last because yeah. there's a deeper issue. There's a, and I, I often feel or, or have noticed that a denial or misunderstanding or a complete blocking of the animal self mm -hmm. leads to the addiction yeah. because you feel like you're not being fed on a deep level. Yeah. Look at the whole results of the Victorian era. The, the, this blocking out of the sexual aspect mm -hmm. leads to the most depravity that you could possibly imagine. Yeah, within within that era. So I think it's it's good to take a look at this card as it's a friendly card in a way. It's like, hey, let's everybody is addicted to something or or some idea or has some behavior. And you know, in my practice, I. I do look at the addict archetype as being universal. Everyone has, to one degree or another, the the addict working working within them. And it's a good time of year to take a look at it and embrace it, to say, hey, wow, this is something I work with. And to not try to put it back in the corner or just try to to change it, to, in, to engage in the process of, of working with it and understanding, you know, what's what's right about what you're working with what is that what is the message of that addiction trying to trying to teach you instead of just going nope i won't do it anymore i'm going to shut the door mm -hmm. so the devil's you know this uh fallen angel archetype this provocateur is is provoking us to take a deeper look and so cindera i mean i guess i had a question a little bit from a mythological standpoint the uh this character here he looks a lot like pan Mm -hmm. who's a, a trickster god and and what do you think about him pan being this like half human half animal creature you know I'm, i want to know more about what you think about that relationship to the body in terms of the animal yeah i think it's an invitation to look at one's natural self pan you have him dancing around in his half goat embodiment half human half animal and, and we have this opportunity here to look and see that connection within ourselves to realize that we are animals i mean nobody everyone always says animals as if they're not themselves an animal so and i think that that uh leads to all kinds of problems and so it's an invitation definitely through this mythological pan creature a professor of mine uh, at pacifica did a whole thesis on on pan and so uh it's a, it's a very interesting character to take a look at uh, and and in the Romani tarot, I believe it was one of my first tarot decks. I was like, yeah, I'm into the gypsies. It was like a real early mm -hmm. manifestation of my interest in tarot. But in that, they they actually cast the devil as this pan creature who's simply just falling out of a a pot, causing mischief. You know, there's nothing more to it than that. That mm. it's just this kind of trickstery, mischievous element that uh, allows us to play and to be ourselves. I recently saw that movie uh, Shrek 2, mm -hmm. which I, uh, you know, I try and avoid films that have two in the title. <laughs> um, sequels suck. But, <laughs> yeah, not sequels. always. Not, not always. always. Shrek 2 was good. And Shrek 2 was really good. And I, I didn't realize that. I, I think I li even it liked happens. it better than the first mm -hmm. one. But it's all about uh, accepting your ogre nature. Accepting your inner ogre. That's yeah. And I, I, I thought that that film was so beautiful and such a departure from the usual uh, Disney beautification fairy tale. You know, it's it's very much about accepting yourself as an animal that burps and farts and and <laughs> you know d is is angry and moody sometimes. You know, those characters are angry and moody at the points, and 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 it's okay to be that way. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity here to to accept oneself as a devil at times, to accept oneself mm -hmm. as an animal, and uh, and all of those needs that we have as human beings as animals not as evil but as necessary to life uh, but if we deny those things from ourselves then these attachments or addictions come in certain forms that have us and we don't yeah, have them exactly they take over i think you make a really excellent point because traditionally this this card is about um, materialistic things almost ignorance and i think that ignorance comes from skipping this step of really looking at what's going on 
So the kind of the example I want to use, and I think might be something that's pretty ubiquitous with people this time of year is um, say something like weight loss, right? Because that really has a lot to do with your own relationship to your body. And the way many people take this, this stage is to, is to in some ways mistreat their body, right? So it's like, you know, bad dog, you know, I'm mm-hmm. gonna, I'm gonna beat you into submission. I want to punish you liver. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> run, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the gym. I mean, they really go pretty, they, they take the same archetype of addiction mm-hmm. and maybe that addiction was food and drink earlier right. and they just pick running on the treadmill or, you know, like, oh, I'm going to do it. And they're skipping this step where they're really relating to their body to go, what is going on? Like, maybe I'm not working with my body or feeding it in the way it needs to be or, or giving it the exercise that it wants and needs. It's more like you've been bad. I'm going to punish you now. And that, that attitude is, is, um, is brought to light here that you don't, you know, it's not necessary to, to look at it as a punishment, to look at, um, the way you've treated your body in the, in the past and the way you're going to treat it now, you know, symbolically is kind of the same. It's like, I I punished myself then, but it felt good. And now I'm going to punish myself and Mm. maybe it won't feel as good. Mm -hmm. So it's this, it's this kind of idea of, of, if you know, what are you a slave? What are you a slave to right now? What mm-hmm. what are you hooked into? Is is the supposed cure for your ills pretty much the same thing? Mm-hmm. You know, I think a great lesson here is that, is that if you suppress the pan, you know, he's just this kind of gentle, frolicking animal with some some basic needs. If you push him down into the pot, you know, and don't let him come out to play. It's he's going to grow into this, you know, monstrous character, a, a more fierce devil that uh can come out in all sorts of ways uh that is just not going to feel good in the end. Yeah. There's that to me brings up the provocateur archetype is that provoking when you say someone's impish or they're devilish they tend to provoke things and i think this is a purposeful step to provoke things in you and it being new year's and whatever i mean that's that provokes people to do a lot to wake up new year's day kind of hung over and going whoa i'm not gonna do that anymore that kind of <laughs> you know i mean that's that's a provocation you I mean, there's there's something very provocative but i think that the danger is to just let that be a one-off, you've been provoked, and then you kind of do something, and then you let it go. This one is saying, go, go deeper this time. Take a look at, um, you know, what, what about the material world have you disavowed yourself of? Mm. Your relationship to your physical body. I personally recommend to people to open up the option of, of loving that physical part of yourself, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and having having a larger um, definition of who you are. You're not just an ego. You're not just a body. You're not just this spiritual presence. There is something totally unique about who you are in total. You know, it's kind of a gestalt. You know, the you are more than the sum of your parts. But to include the body, and Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the quote, and I'll put it on the website. um, The quote from Mary Oliver, the poet. It just occurred to me is, you know, all you need to. You don't need to be perfect. I'm paraphrasing it. You don't need to be perfect. You just need you know, to love what that soft animal body loves. Mm, mm-hmm. And that to me, I think is a good, is a good and appropriate lesson for, you know, or a hint of what the, this card is talking about. Um, and to, to pay attention to those physical instincts and yet don't, don't let them, you know, rule you. And this is like a time of contemplation and going deeper this time of like, what is it really, really about? Yeah, and and how to have that conversation, how to go deeper. So all all these parts that you feel are bad, uh, you can you can literally have an active imagination conversation with that part of the body or with that urge or that craving. You can bring it into an uh, animated life uh, and have a conversation with it. This was uh, Carl Jung's approach of active mm-hmm. imagination. Or if you know if it's too hard to delve up an image out of your own craving. Uh, you can have a conversation with the devil card, you know, bring this animated, he's full of life, this devil, uh, and have a conversation about what you think is bad, what you think you sh- the shoulds and shouldn'ts of life, the problems one might have with the, the animal nature or cravings and desires. 
what you're attached to that these can be brought up into a conversation or journaling if that sounds more normal mm -hmm. for you <laughs> any kind of safe space i think when you're when you have come to the place like this where you are going to you're going to you feel the need to mention the unmentionable and to do that in a safe supportive group i know there's a lot of 12 step groups that's what they provide therapists friends you know there are a lot of people this time of year who are like quitting smoking or dieting and and a big part of that is that group right you know the group aspect where it's a safe space for people to go oh i did that too or i do that too and and people tend to talk about their shadows essentially of you know all the all the things they did that were ridiculous while they were drinking heavily or you know smoking or whatever whatever it is and the devil also gives us an opportunity to really connect in our relationships whether it's a friendship or a partnership is that if you can share that deepest blackest down there devil that you think you can't show anybody when you can get the courage to share that with somebody you actually be open up an opportunity to bond with them deeper, to, mm -hmm. to really show more of yourself with them. It's because they got that part of themselves as well, right? And then you're making it safe for them to share who they truly are with you as well. So yeah, if you thought this was a scary card, hey, you know, there's there's so, so much here. And I think just, well, I mean, because it's the devil and, and obviously there's just immense amount of history and uh, from Judeo-Christian, all of them, the devils basically exist in all the wisdom traditions, even Tibetan, uh, Buddhist, everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Um, it, but the idea that I think we're, we're presenting here is, is the reason all of those traditions have a devil character is it's like our, it's our collective projection of all the crap we don't want to right. look at. <laughs> That's right. You know, I mean, it is yeah. powerful and it is powerful because we repress it and, mm -hmm. and it gets it the more you press it back the more it gains power that's right you know and um and if anyone rejects that devil in you they ain't worth your time <laughs> <laughs> well well it's it's a matter of projection we tend to we will dislike and um move away from anything that we see in someone else that we see in ourselves mm -hmm. that we're not ready to look at or we're not ready to work with so it is a big deal and this is you know we're still in the underworld here we're still in this um, regrowth period where we're we're coming upon things like our passions our temptations um, to a degree doubt you know people can be addicted to doubt you wanted to jump to rebirth you say <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to get to the flowers and the seeds and the birds <laughs> wow <laughs> we're going down further here yeah. we go well I think we that skipping to that rebirth and flower and birds it wouldn't really mean much it just i don't think it would it would be like this movie where yeah they faced a little bit of adversity but then it got better but then the now, end. now we're in the disney movie <laughs> this is i think we're really more in like a danish film at this point <laughs> we're going lars von trier for a little while thanks so, for sticking with us i know so so I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the addict archetype. The addict really covers a lot, a lot of things. I mean, the, you know, the shopaholic, the glutton, workaholic, the perfectionist. I mean, the, the, we can be addicted to anything besides the usual suspects of food and alcohol and sex. And chocolate. Chocolate, you know, I don't know. Okay, we, let's leave chocolate out of this. But, <laughs> but you can... If, if you're going to ban chocolate, it's just going to sneak its way back in. I'm telling exactly. you right now. We recommend small amounts of chocolate over a long period of time. <laughs> um, but there's, I mean, even as, as out there as spiritual practice and the way that people approach their own practices, if 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 basically you are, if your head and your heart are separated, if your head is saying one thing and your heart is saying another, and your will, which is what you do next, the way you make your choices, um, if there's a blockage there, if things aren't working, that's the addict. That's that, like, I am completely compelled to go and do this. And it's Chocolate. interesting. Chocolate. And when I... <laughs> We've already talked about chocolate. We're fine. We'll get you some later. Um, but when I Googled the uh, the addict archetype just recently, people came up with, um, like, the TV show Monk. I don't think he's – I mean, yeah, it is the addict, but it's, it's like, a, um, he's compulsive about what he does. So there's no – 
you know, the head and the heart are are there. So I think that's it's a decent example of of what it can be. And it's in its positive aspect, and believe me, there is one for this archetype, is that it it will come up and remind us of where our power is in that moment. And it, it can recognize that an action or a substance can influence in, influence us in such a way that we start working on autopilot. Because when an addict is in full addict mode, there's basically a very narrow band. It's either I have what I want or I don't have it. It's It, it becomes very, very narrow. And that this recognizing it as this archetype that takes a hold of us can give us that first sort of glimpse of like, oh, wow, this is really, really taking over. And then from there you can work with it, ask for help. And confronting it and being able to break an old pattern can be extremely freeing. I mean, there are so many people who've recovered from major addictions that said, you know what? I didn't realize I could do it. But when I did, I could do anything. You know, once I quit drinking or quit smoking or quit obsessing over being perfect, once you beat that, I mean, it's a it's a big test um, that many of, I mean, I would say everybody has a little bit of the addict archetype one way or another. And things like perfectionism are just so socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. They are. I mean, you've got social pressure against drinking and drugs and sex and all of those things. So that, you know, that's there. But perfectionism, that, I mean, people tend to have rewards for being a perfectionist. I personally don't think that's right. It's it's the same thing. You're addicted to the unattainable to a degree. And then it's all about the devil in the details. And the devil is in the details. You want to talk about that a little bit more? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what what that means is that it's it's not the bigger picture that's being paid attention mm -hmm. to that you're not submitting yourself uh to this to to the real parts of yourself emerging. It's it's a dedication to this little thing. It's just got to be right here. That's, exactly. Know. So that, And that can happen to anybody. I mean, if you're people who are obsessed with their bodies and perfection, they can't see the big picture. They can't see the, the beauty of the total part of who they are. They're obsessing about their pinky toe that doesn't look right or the extra little bit of fat that's on their butt or whatever it is. That's that's the the devil in the details with the perfectionist is there's there's no way they're ever going to be happy until this one thing is fixed and then they're going to find something else. So that's where that that devil shows up is you just you can't have any perspective of of accepting yourself the way you are and it's very difficult to be in relationship with a perfectionist. Um, Tell just, me about it. They're never happy and and that you know. It's difficult to be in relationship with, um, you know, like that third partner, that obsessive uh, compulsive part that just says it has to be this way. So it's, it's definitely something um, to look at the, look at the addict to go, you know, where, where is my true integrity and honesty? And where is that being compromised when I'm working with this, you know, addictive behavior? And to understand too, you know, everyone goes through it. And again, going back to processes and groups um, to understand that this is, you know, this is how we can find our common humanity. Yeah. So why don't we hunker down and explore some more films? And we, we're not going to throw some obvious, there's so many obvious devil many. movies out there. Yeah. But uh, Julian, you've put together a list of some really amazing movies that can explore the devil archetype, the addict archetype. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're so right. I, I didn't I didn't put any of the really obvious ones there, and and because I think it's um, I really encourage people to if there's any of these films you're interested in, rent them, get them on Netflix, whatever, watch them again, and that's a great way to learn about how these archetypes you know are in play in our lives. And oddly enough, what kind of came up for me for the both the addict and sort of this devil stage and this obsessiveness. Believe it or not, is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, mm. and it doesn't really matter which chocolate. See, <laughs> can't she's she's obsessed. All right, all right, so we'll just dive fully into this whole Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and it, it doesn't matter which one you watch, the older one from the the seventies or the more modern um, one. It's the same thing. These characters, each one of these kids, 
and their their guide or their their parent are obsessed and kind of narcissistically obsessed with themselves and what they want and they're that's that's totally the heart of this devil stage and this card is like it's all about getting what i want whether it's the girl uh the little rich girl who's like i want it now you know and she's obsessed to the the tv kid who's all about television the gum chewing girl all of them each of those characters even charlie um with his grandfather have their own sort of obsession with you know, what they want. And I think the beautiful part of the story is you kind of see the sort of mythopoetic, each one of those people kind of get what they deserve. And even though Charlie and his grandfather kind of break the rules, um, trying to get what they want, you know, they had fun with the bubbles and they floated around. There was, there was a moment where they really, really faced that. And they realized that they had done wrong and they have another, you know, there's a sense of, of rewriting themselves and and kind of coming back and this the character of Willy Wonka is a, he's a provocateur he's devilish he's poking people into things and this whole trip this whole factory tour of Charlie and the Ch Chocolate Factory was to for him to find out who could inherit his kingdom who could he provoke each one of these to test them to see where their heart really really was and you know the character of charlie and the way his family is and everything that it just it worked out in this very like poetic beautiful way where you know all of those other obsessions got dropped and he just kind of had to show up and admit that he was wrong and that he was sorry and um you know he kind of came out on the other side in this in this beautiful way and so i I thought it was kind of out of left field, but the more I thought about the film, I was like, that's totally it right there. And I think sort of a friendly, friendly, fun kind of movie to watch. And to kind of take that on the other side, <laughs> the film uh, Black Swan from a couple of years ago. Oh, we saw that together. Did we? Oh, we did. Yeah. We did. Double of theater. Yeah, it's true. It was, it was a, that's another one. It's about obsession. It's, it's the perfectionist archetype. It's how we can get absolutely obsessed with something and two with that um something note worth noting is other people will support you in your addictions like the mother of the, mm. the ballerina completely egged her her daughter on and fed that obsessiveness so people can you know you can bond on the light side of the addict and recognizing and supporting each other to make a change but you can also bond in your common obsession over something and uh, that's something too that you can really investigate by watching that film and one that's uh, another one that's kind of out of left field is a film from oh gosh i think the late 90s called election it's a film by alexander payne and it's reese witherspoon and matthew broderick and there's so much obsession and addiction and trying to, you know, really, really trying to have like self-control and figure out what you want. There's a lot of denial and repression in it. And it's funny. It's funny and it's dark too. But I, I think that film election is, is definitely all about this devil stage and bringing things out and denial. And, and then on the, in the show notes, I will list, I've listed so many other great films that really talk about the addict archetype in uh, in probably a little more straightforward ways, like um, Anne Hathaway and Rachel Rachel getting married, um, leaving Las Vegas with Nicolas Cage, the movie about Pollock I thought was great with Ed Harris. So there's a lot out there, and it's it's so common. And I think this is it's a good time of year to take a look at it and maybe face whatever your resolutions are. Um, in a different way, in a little more holistic way, rather than just shutting them out and trying to punish them and make them go away. Invite them in, you know, have a conversation with what's really, really going on and, and, and work with it, including the body. Oh, hey, my little coda to this whole thing that I thought might be appropriate is um, because addictions can be addicted to anything. Um, a friend of mine the other day was talking about Oracle addiction. I was like, what, to the software? <laughs> She's like, no. So like tarot cards. And I went, oh, that's big. I think everybody who works with tarot cards or any kind of um, system of divination or whatever you want to call it, um, you can get addicted to, I got to pull a card. I got to pull a card. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you get so superstitious about um, making decisions that you really can get addicted to 
oracle cards or tarot cards. Um, and that's something that we can, can fall into this whole category. Take another look at what your relationship is to the tarot. And, and from my own, and this, this happened years ago when I was younger, it's like, you know, you come to realize that if you keep pulling a tarot card for something and you get, you know, you keep trying to get that different answer because you don't like the first one that come up, <laughs> the universe is going to send you something to throw you off course and you get the trickster immediately, mm. which to me is also this pan character. Mm. So. And did you know that tarot is the devil's tool? This is what I've, I've heard, you know. Yeah. So be careful. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sarcasm is the devil's tool, Sandera. <laughs> I I guess me and the devil are just too great of pals these days. Can you tell someone has the provocateur archetype? <laughs> I'm married to the provocateur type. <laughs> um, uh, also, since we're talking about recommendations, uh, and in the theme of this card, which was getting in touch with your animal self, uh, Many of you who are listening to this podcast have probably already heard of Ted Andrews' Animal Speak book, which is just wonderful compilation of basic but interesting facts about all different kinds of animals, many different kinds. You can't get all of them in there, obviously. Uh, but a wonderful way to research animals, you know, uh, and how they might be related to individual growth and, and symbolism and so forth. Uh, so if you have a dream about a certain animal, you can look it up in this book, or if it's just up for you and you're seeing a certain animal everywhere, uh, take a look at it, see what it might mean for you. Uh, and it's also just a wonderful way to learn about and connect with the natural world and what's beyond human and what makes us human sometimes is being connected to and having awareness of different life lifestyles out there. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And, um, all of a link to that and... A link and resources and photos will all be in the show notes, which you can find out at the end of this recording. So, I don't know. Have we, have we done justice to the devil, do you think, Sandera? Well, I would like to mention also that oh. uh, if you're left-handed... <laughs> <laughs> it's the devil's <laughs> hand. <laughs> Just saying. Well, actually, that means you're using your right brain a lot, which is very creative. Are you left-handed, Sandera? I don't even know. No, no, I'm right. No, I'm right uh, unfortunately, too. yes. But if you are left-handed... You may be using that creative right brain a little more than the rest of us. Uh, but of course, the creative right brain means you're the devil. So uh, <laughs> let's leave it there. I knew you had a tie in there somewhere. Yes. So, all right. Yes. Well, you know, it's been a fun Well, one. look, the devil. He's, 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 he's holding it with he, his left hand. He's left handed. Yeah. You know. Okay. Anyway. We're going on. But um, <laughs> if, as always, if you want to contact us, please send us an email at at podcast at archetypist.com. We always love hearing from you and we will be bringing you the next podcast on drum roll, the tower, uh, coming up in about a month. So look for that one coming soon and check out the archives. We have, we're, we're on like podcast 17 now. So, um, if you like what you hear, um, chocolate. and you like chocolate, then you should go back and listen to the rest of them. But until then, I hope everyone's having a great year and take care of yourselves until next time. Ciao. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we invite you to become a part of the archetypal tarot team by becoming one of our patrons. Our patrons are awesome. So if you're interested, visit tiny dot cc slash tarot for more information and the awesome rewards for joining that's tiny dot cc slash tarot thanks for listening to the archetypal tarot podcast for more information on this show and the resources that we talked about go to the show notes at archetypist.com slash two zero one three slash zero one slash two five slash devil or just go to archetypist.com and type in devil in the search box. Thanks so much.